Good afternoon. Today, I thought I'd start with some dramatic music, kind of add something different to the lectures. Um, today, we're going to talk about the largest mass extinction in Earth history. Some people have nicknamed this the day the Earth almost died or the great dying. Um, the extinction itself took place 252 million years ago, and it was the greatest mass extinction ever recorded in Earth history. It was larger than the Ordovician and Devonian crisis, and even the better known End Cretaceous extinction that killed all the dinosaurs. In all, between 90 to 95 percent of marine species were eliminated as a result of this Permian extinction. That includes the death of the fusilinid forams, trilobites, which were reduced and greatly reduced, but this is the end of the trilobites at the end Permian. The rugose and tabulate corals are all gone, blastoids, placoderms, plecosaurs, all die out at the end of the Permian. The other groups that were substantially reduced were the bryozoans, the brachiopods, ammonoids, sharks, bony fish, crinoids, eurypterids, ostracods, and echinoderms. So it really touched um, a little bit on everything, and this was um, was devastating to the marine ecosystem. It was also devastating to the terrestrial ecosystem and basically everything in terms of plants and animals that we saw uh, arise during the Permian and earlier those that went through were also all wiped out. So you can imagine the earth was just, you know, in, in the Permian, it, life was thriving, the earth was kind of lush green for the most part. I mean, at the poles there were there was ice, but the earth was in, in pretty good shape. And then it seems, um, the reason it's called the day the earth almost died, because it seems that almost overnight, um, everything was wiped out. As with most mass extinctions, there are a lot of ideas as to what may have caused this mass extinction. And it's not really known for sure. There's some really good candidates out there. Um, probably the best we'll talk about is the eruption of Siberian traps, a large volcanic eruption. But it's not settled. Um, if you polled if you polled a vast majority of geoscientists today and asked them, okay, what caused the Permian extinction, most likely they would say the Siberian traps. But there are other explanations, and it's not just the fact that there was a large eruption, and it was particularly the style of eruption and where the eruption happened and what might have occurred during that re eruption that, that caused the the mass extinctions. So I'm going to go through some of these ideas including, of course, the Siberian traps, talk about how this might have resulted in the largest extinction in Earth history. Um, one of the early ideas, um, it, it kind of comes and goes. So Siberian traps have always been in this backdrop, and then you hear this glaciation as a cause for the end Permian extinction. And it's thought, People think about glaciations because it is largely thought to be responsible for the Ordovician glaciation, perhaps even the Devonian um, glaci glaciation, one of the Devonian extinctions. There is glaciation on Gondwana. The Gondwana continent is sitting, at least part of it is sitting over the South Pole, and it is heavily glaciated. So if you get a similar glaciation event in the Permian, you could produce a mass extinction in the same manner as previous, so global widespread cooling and lowering of sea levels, coupled with the fact that now during the Permian we have a the large supercontinent of Pangaea fully assembled. So we've reduced the interior of the continents, the the you know the the rain shadow on the interior of the continent because it's so big, it tends to be dry. And then you cool and lower sea level on the margins of that supercontinent, you really reduce the area available for shallow sea life. And shallow sea life is the source of food for just about everything in the ocean and then animals, you know, on land that may feed off some of the animals in the ocean would also be wiped out. Um you would lose you would lose 
um, trees, um, and, along with the dying. So this is a, a climate change mechanism um, for driving the Permian extinction via glaciation, mainly by glaciation. If we look at Pangaea um, during the Permian, here it is the supercontinent Pangaea. This is about 270 to 260, so just before the Permian extinction, you can see here is this glaciation that actually begins to extend even um, more towards the equator during the late Permian. So it's a, it is a big uh, glaciation that takes place at the end of the Permian. The problem with this, of course, um, is that it appears, and I'll show you some pictures of the fossil record, it appears from the fossil record that this extinction happened almost overnight. It was a geological blip. So here we're looking at glaciations that took place 10 to 15 to 20 million years ahead of the Permian extinction, and it's hard to imagine. It's easy to imagine that you could see a gradual die out of organisms due to glaciation, but this instantaneous or near instantaneous die out just doesn't mesh very well with, with a large scale glaciation. Um, another theory or hypothesis that explains the mass extinctions in the Permian kind of goes along with the glaciation. You have the reduction of shallow continental shelves due to the formation of this supercontinent Pangaea. This would result in ecological competition for space, which then might act as an agent for extinction. You have limited space, you have lots of competition for that space, and it, it can drive it can drive radiation, it can also drive extinction. This is a viable theory, um, but the formation of Pangaea and ensuing destruction of the continental shelves occurred early and middle Permian and the mass extinction did not occur into the late Permian. So Pangaea formed well below this extinction. So again, it's a timing thing. When we look at the fossil record, it appears to be a very quick extinction. That's how I got the name the day the Earth almost died. So it appears to be this fairly quick extinction. So it's really hard to, to uh, mesh this idea that the formation of Pangaea causes extinction when indeed the formation of Pangaea occurred much earlier and we don't really see a big extinction during the Permo Carboniferous. Um, the one that gains and has a lot of favor right now is this uh, idea that volcanic eruptions and some of the consequences of volcanic eruptions causes mass extinction. And most paleontologists, again, if you polled them, they would credit the mass extinction as a result of huge basaltic lava eruptions in Siberia. These are called Siberian traps. Trap volcanism, we're gonna hear this again when we talk about the Deccan traps in the Cretaceous. Trap volcanism means um, large scale um, fissure type eruptions, not not really those big volcanoes that you tend to draw or tend to see in pictures, but these are fissure eruptions that are just erupting just kilometer cubic kilometers of basaltic magma just erupting out on the surface one right after the other. So these almost constant large volume eruptions of basaltic lava over a real short period of time. And so these volcanic eruptions are, they're dumping a lot of things into the atmosphere, but in particular things like sulfates and sulfates with, and mixes with um, the upper atmosphere, you get sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide then mixes with rainwater to form a weak sulfuric acid. When sulfuric acid is rained down into the terrestrial realm or even into the seawater, you're basically dumping sulfuric acid on living organisms, in particular, things like trees and plants, which are the primary food source for many animals and then the animals that eat those animals and so forth. So you, you would wipe out fairly quickly, you would wipe out the terrestrial ecosystem you would in effect acidify the oceans. And um, we'll talk about CO2 being dumped into the atmosphere. Um, so in some ways this is similar to what happens in the acidification of the ocean. You have lots of carbon dioxide going into the oceans and bleaching the coral reefs and so forth. This would happen relatively quickly. 
that's sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide. In addition, this combination of sulfates in the atmosphere, the large ash clouds that were produced during, during these eruptions may have lowered um, global temperatures and reduced the incoming solar radiation. So you have sulfur dioxide, you have acid rain, you have cooler overall atmosphere. Um, this, this combination of effects can occur rather quickly and the die out can be fairly quick if you have this going on. The age of the lava flows, I showed this in the first slide, you can go back and look at it, it's about 252 million years ago. And that is the Permian Triassic boundary. So the age of these lava flows um, date perfectly to this interval of mass extinction. Now, having said that, uh, Trap volcanism occurs over a relatively short period of time, but it's not just one eruption, it's many eruptions. So in fact, the Siberian trap volcanism started a little bit before the end of the Permian and continued into the Triassic. So the volcanism itself occurred over a longer period of time, but we probably had these pulses of just massive um, volcanism erupting up into the atmosphere and then causing all these secondary effects. So we'll talk about some of these. So secondary conclusion, that large volumes of halogens were released in these eruptions that also caused the destruction of the ozone layer and increased mutagenesis. That's, that is really hard to, to mix with the idea that you reduce incoming solar radiation by dumping all this ash material into the upper atmosphere, right? You, that would tend to cause global global cooling and it really wouldn't matter if there was an ozone hole, hole because you had cloudiness, overall cloudiness. So these, these two are a little bit competing, nevertheless, um, they have been suggested. Um, how big were these? Well, if you, this is a map of Russia and here in purple, these are, the purple are what are left of these basalt flows, probably this entire region um, and more was covered by basalt flows. The red here are volcanic ashes that are associated with these lava flows um, in Siberia. Here's a canyon cut through. Um, these are sedimentary rocks and then these are uh, trapped volcanic sitting on top of them. Here you can see a huge volume of uh, trapped volcanism. Uh, this is on the order of about uh, 3,000, 4,000 feet of basaltic lavas here. So these are really, really thick, almost constant volcanism, constant lava pouring out um, during the end of the Permian. One of the other ideas, interesting find actually, um, within the last couple of years is that these, volcano, these volcanoes, these eruptions that you see on the surface, of course, have a plumbing system. We talked a little bit about that, the, these feeder dikes. They have a plumbing system that are coming up in, in the case of the Siberian Trap. They're coming up through, through sedimentary rocks, in particular carbon carbonates, uh, things like limestones and coals. Both limestones and coals are carbon rich. And what happens is sometimes these dikes come up and, through these sediments and sometimes they're unable to reach the surface. So they go out, lat, flow out laterally within these sedimentary sequences and these are called sills. So dikes are vertical igneous features, igneous intrusive features into the rock. And sills are these horizontal, uh, they're typically bedding parallel intrusions of volcanic material. You should have learned this in, in your intro course, but if you didn't, dikes are vertical, sills are horizontal. And these are, of course, hot. They're about 1200 degrees centigrade, so they will melt the sediments. And if the sediments are rich in, in carbon dioxide, car calcium carbonate is limestone, coal is carbon, just pure carbon. So you have this, you have this massive carbon reservoir in these sediments. And you also, it turns out, the halogens that were released, these gases I mentioned earlier, those are typically formed in salts and halides. So also within these, these marine sediments are salt deposits. So you've got this combination of 
of carbon reservoir and the salt reservoir, and you have this 1200 degree magma coming up through and melting those. And you can then produce a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide and halogens into the atmosphere. In fact, it's likely that um, these coals were set on fire by this magma. And so one idea is that it's not just the volcanism. The volcanism alone is not enough to cause this mass extinction, but it's the volcanism in 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 harmony with the fact that it's moving up to these carbon-rich sediments that causes this really big rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the problems associated. To give you an idea just how sharp this mass extinction is, um, these are um, these are late Permian reefs, so these are per before the extinction. You can see here these limestone rocks sitting here. Um, and this this particular diagram, these rocks have been tilted. So on this side is after the Permian. On this side is before the Permian. And the Permian extinction line runs right up through here. And if it, you look at it closely, you can see here these late Permian reefs, very well preserved, the line of extinction. And then above this, there's absolutely um, no record of Permian reefs. And you can see it in the outcrop as well. You can see these, these big blocks of limestone sticking up and Permian extinction, no limestone cliffs um, sticking up. So this is, this is why most people believe that this mass extinction was as quick as anything we've ever seen in Earth history. And the record shows this over and over and over wherever you look, you see life, boom, nothing. And so this seems to fit much better with the idea of these um, huge volcanic eruptions taking place at the end of the Permian. Um, other people um, said, well, you know, well, even volcanic eruptions, even though they are really fast and you know you have this huge volume of lavas, you're still talking about maybe a few hundred thousand years or millions of years. And if you really want a good, quick extinction, best way to do that is to hit the Earth with an asteroid. So back in 2001, some scientist, uh, Peter Ward, um, found fullerenes, these so-called buckyballs. These are basically produced when an asteroid impact hits the Earth. And they found these in Permian sediments, and they suggested that um, perhaps an asteroid was at least partially responsible for the Permian mass extinction. So, okay, maybe. Um, that one hasn't held much as much um, sway as the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous, but it's out there. Um, there is another idea that there was this um, release of halocarbons or methane clathrate release in the oceans. Uh, you produce a tremendous amount of methane by um, at the bottom of the ocean where it's cold. Methane is, tends to freeze in these clathrate deposits, and if they melt, either due to global warming or some other effect, um, if those methane clathrates um, melt, they re release a pr tremendous amount of methane into the atmosphere. And methane is a greenhouse gas. It's really short-lived, so you have to release a lot of methane into the atmosphere to, for that to happen. But then you can produce some um, other things like um, from drying salt lakes, you can release um, chloroform, trichloroethane, tetrachloroethane from drying salt lakes that may have killed off the primary producers on land. The point of this is not to um, it's not to lay blame on any one thing. I prefer these Siberian traps. It seems to make the most uh, sense to me because you have all these secondary effects that might happen as this lava is moving through and so forth. But this is very typical. There's there's two things that people love to explain. They love to explain extinctions, and they love to explain radiation. So 
scientists love when things change. Either things begin, life begins to to burst onto the scene, or life goes extinct. You don't hear a lot of. There's not a lot of interesting stories out there about well, what was happening, um, say during the Middle Cretaceous, when everything was the climate was wonderful, everything was warm, dinosaurs were roaming around. They make nice movies like uh, Jurassic Park or Triassic Park. But it's really the extinctions that capture the imagination of a lot of scientists. So everyone, whenever you have an extinction or you have a radiation, I, we talked a lot about the Cambrian radiation. Scientists want to say, I have the reason that the Cambrian radiation took place. I have the reason that the Permian extinction took place. So you get a lot of hypotheses. And then you have to sit there and look at the evidence and look at all these competing hypotheses and make a determination as to which one of those makes the most sense. As I said, my personal um, favorite or my personal idea is that the evidence around the world shows that this transition was relatively rapid, less than 100,000 years. Um, although there was a paper last month that, that suggested a, a more protracted extinction that kind of started in the late Permian and you know continued on. Maybe so, maybe life was in decline, but something happened at the end of the Permian that wiped everything out. And when you look at, especially when you look at those Permian-Triassic boundary sections, like the one I showed you in China, you have limestone sticking out of the cliff, then you have nothing. So that's pretty quick from a geologic perspective, as close as we can date it. It is on the order of less than 100,000 years. And for, for a geologist, that's like snap of the fingers, right? It's really quick. The effect of this, of course, on oceans I already talked about, on the terrestrial organisms, well, plant and land animals were almost completely wiped out, at least 95%. Um, the, if you look at the early Triassic, the Mesozoic fossil beds, such as they are, the rocks are almost lifeless. There's really not much in the early Triassic. You look at, it just looks like that China section. You have life on one side, you have nothing on the other side. And so that's why some refer to the Permian extinction as the day the planet nearly died. So, once that extinction happened, of course, um, we know because we're here studying that life went on. And so we can look at the recovery and we can start to look at what happened following that extinction. So that moves us into the Mesozoic era. And the Mesozoic era, of course, um, lasted from the end of the Permian 252 million years ago until 66 million years ago. The Mesozoic, kind of, it kind of comes in with one of these big extinctions and it leaves with one of these big extinctions. And the interesting thing, of course, about these two extinctions, if you look um, at them, you'll start to notice there's very, they're very similar in terms of the explanations that have been forwarded to explain those two big extinctions, the end Permian and the end Cretaceous. The end Cretaceous is not nearly as devastating as the end Permian, although it was one of the so-called big big five extinctions in Earth history. Um, the Mesozoic, of course, is made up of three periods, the Triassic, the most famous um, geological period out there, the Jurassic, I think almost everyone, everyone now knows the Jurassic, thanks to Jurassic Park, and then the, the Cretaceous. Um, by the way, while I'm, I'm on this topic, I had office hours Monday, and a student asked me if, if you needed to, if we were gonna have quizzes on the time scale. There will be no quizzes on the time scale. Um, hopefully you've learned a lot of it. If you continue on with the major, you'll have me in field methods, you'll have me in field camp. Um, I will insist there that you also know the, the time scale because we're going out into the field then and we're looking at rocks and I'm gonna show you here's a rock that's Triassic, here's a rock here. Um, that is, you know, middle Jurassic, how much time is missing between those two intervals. And if you have the time scale on the top of your head, it's easy. It's an easy question to answer. It puts the geology in context. I'm not going to do it now because I, 
I don't see a way to really do this without I mean a quiz on the time scale is a lot of a lot of work to try to prevent um not that you're gonna cheat, but to prevent people from you know glancing at their phones or or anything else. So you've learned a lot of it, you'll learn a lot of it more, but there'll be no more quizzes on the time scale, all right? That's just an aside. So the Mesozoic is made up of these three periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. In terms of major events during the Mesozoic, the big one here, the big two actually, is the breakup of Pangaea and then the breakup of the southern continent of Gondwana. The rise of the reptiles, the Mesozoic is known as the age of reptiles, and in particular dinosaurs are the reptiles that, that dominate the globe during the Mesozoic. Um, we get smaller mammals, cool things like flight, um, animals take to the air. There are several major flood basalt provinces, and those are typically those basalt flood provinces are associated very closely with the breakup of Pangaea and also the breakup of parts of Gondwana. And then there are extinctions, the Triassic, Jurassic extinction about 200 million years ago, and the more famous, the most famous extinction, even though the Permian was the biggest extinction, the most famous extinction, of course, is the end Cretaceous extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs and led to the clearing of the ecological space that allowed humans to take over um, the globe and mammals first. We look at the early Triassic about 237 million years ago. Just look at what's going on. You really don't see much. Pangaea is still pretty much intact here. Here's Laurasia, North America here. Um, this is the first glimpse of Florida. If you look in this map here, you can see the Florida Peninsula here sticking out um, in between South America and West Africa. And indeed, it should be shown more often, but Florida was attached to the southern continent of Gondwana before it was attached to Laurasia. So we'll talk about this in a, a little bit later, but Florida was part of Gondwana. You, if you go into the basement rocks of Florida, so you dig wells down into the to the rocks of Florida, you'll find volcanic rocks, you'll find metamorphic rocks, and they look very similar to volcanic rocks and metamorphic rocks that are found in both South America and Africa. So it's, it was probably sandwiched in between those two and then left behind when Pangaea broke apart. The Triassic itself, you may wonder where did that name come from? It was um, named in 1834, and you'll have to excuse my German here, but by August uh, Friedrich August von Alberte, and he recognized three distinctive formations in southern Germany. They are called the Bunter, the Muschelkalk, and the Kuiper formations. So these are three rock formations in southern Germany. That's where the Trias came from, so three Trias, and it is called, he called this the Triassic system, and it's still called the Triassic system. The old term Trias is still often used in Europe, even by English-speaking geologists, so you also, you'll sometimes hear people talking about the Trias. It is the same thing as the Triassic, and that's where the name came from, these three uh, distinctive formations in southern Germany. The Triassic biosphere was not that great. Um, following the permanent extinction, life began to reestablish itself. Everywhere you look in those boundary sections, I, the one I showed you in China, the, you know, the, the great one, um, those early, they're, they're really barren. There's, you can look for a long time before you find a fossil in those early Triassic, but there must have been life around because life does reestablish itself in both the oceans, in the marine realm, and also in the terrestrial realm. And of course, the most, most impressive of these is in the terrestrial realm with the rise of the, the reptiles. In the ocean, the fusilinid forams, uh, many bryozoans, rugos, corals, and trilobites, had all disappeared, so we don't see them in the ocean anymore. But we do see a number of new animals, like ammonoids and brachiopods. 
do recover, um, in particular the ammonites um, really begin to blossom, although the early ammonites were wiped out. The Cretaceous and the, the Mesozoic is dominated by these beautiful ammonite fossils. Brachiopods make it through, um, begin to dominate um, in particular, spirifid brachiopods, ricanelids. Um, ammonites evolve from a single lineage that survived the unpermian extinction, and there's a high diversity of these serotitic uh, type ammonites. There's new groups of squids like belemnites that would become abundant in the Jurassic. Uh, most modern groups of invertebrates also appear during the Triassic. Um, like echinoderms and then new, more modern type scleractinian corals, so again, reef. And in the equatorial regions, they, they form these small patch reefs, no more than a meter high, and often built on decaying remains of sponge reefs. On land, insects begin to flourish from the few survivors of the Permian mass extinction. And in particular, um, there's a rise of the social insects in the Mesozoic. So here are some pictures of ammonites, and these straight cone things here are called belemnites, uh, typical fossils. Here are um, a fossil scleractinian coral here. These are modern types of scleractinian corals. So the corals that we see in the Mesozoic, they are different. They're not exactly the same as modern corals, but modern corals are are the descendants of these early Mesozoic scleractinian corals. Things like bees, the social insect, this is a bee fossil from the Triassic Chinle formation. Um, these are bees' nests, fossil bees' nests in the Triassic Chinle formation. If you go out to field camp, you will see a lot of the Chin Li. Um, the Chin Li is also famous for the petrified forest member. One of the one of the members of the Chin Li formation is the petrified forest member that is the home of Petrified Forest National Park. But the Chin Li extends all across the desert southwest. It, it's really extensive. Um, I showed this before as a trace fossil. This is this uh, the one that, the interesting thing about this trace fossil is that people saw these out west for a long time and they had no idea what they were um, until a buddy of mine named Steve Hasiotis went out and started looking at them more carefully and he realized these are trace fossils, these are um, these are termite mounds basically, fossil termite, termite mounds. These are, I believe these are Jurassic in age um, here. The new vertebrates, so coming out of that extinction, we start seeing new vertebrate fossils, including um, the dinosaurs, but we see um, these ectothermic, cold-blooded um, archos archosauromorphs that are cold-blooded, and they attain prominence over the therapsids, the warm-blooded mammal-like reptiles that were living in the, in the Permian. Um, there are herbivorous lizards, uh, lizards that are also very common. Rivers and ponds were populated by, uh, um, you know, these these her herbivorous lizards that lived on the near the water and feast on these um, plants. There were other things that lived in the sea, like lungfish, um, ichthyosaurs. Um, placodonts and, and lots of other things. So both the marine and the terrestrial realm were dominated by reptile and lizard type forms. And later in the Triassic, the archosaurian dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, the first flying reptiles, and even the proto-crocodiles proto began to appear. So again, lizards took over the land. There are some mammals, the first true mammals, appeared near the uh, very end um, of the Triassic, but they would remain insignificant and would really only come into their own after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So this is one of the, the perfect case of uh, this clearing of ecospace at the end of the Permian and then 
kind of the first organisms in that were able to succeed were really the reptiles, even though mammals were around. The mammals couldn't compete with the reptiles, and so they remain relatively small and insignificant, probably hiding, just like if we were back there, right? When, we, when the dinosaurs go loose in Jurassic Park, we have to hide. Uh, probably the same thing was true with the mammals. They were small, they couldn't compete, so they just kind of eked out an existence throughout the Triassic. Once the lizards died out, the mammals were able to take over the earth in the Cenozoic. Um, and then the ancestors of small familiar animals like frogs and lizards um, also first appear during this time. So here's some of these early uh, Sorosuchus, uh, Lagosuchidae, Mastodon. These are the early um, crocodilians here. These are all found, um, in particular, these two are found quite often out in the in the Chinle Formation out in New Mexico where we have our field camp. You see, you see fossils of some of these Sorosuchus. These three in particular, I think, are all at the Ghost Ranch Museum out west. Um, in in the ocean, in the marine realm, you have the Placodons, the Pistosaurs, um, dominating the oceans. In terms of land plants, you get um, these great coal swamp with lycopods, phenopsids, um, that were in the Permian actually they didn't do very well in the dry Triassic climate so they if you remember the Permian you had these swamp like things dominating and this cooler overall climate by the time you get to the Triassic everything is kind of dry especially in the interior of that supercontinent and so they died out um, and it was probably dominated by evergreen trees like conifers and gymnosperms. The Gondwana flora and the famous Glossopteris fauna in the Permian dies out and is replaced by a seed fern called Dicrodium. Um, in Laurasia, the flora is made up of uh, conifers, uh, cycads, ginkgos, ground and tree ferns, and things like sphenopsids. So there were still these two distinct flora, the Gondwana flora and the Laurasian flora, that occupied the land. So this is this is what a cycad forest looked like. This is the fossil leaf dicrodium. These are fossil ginkgo leaves. This is again the the plant life during the Triassic. In terms of tectonics, um, Pangaea remains largely intact until the very end of the Triassic. And then during the late Triassic, the crust between um, Laurasia and Gondwana begins to extend. So the, the zone that was a collision zone begins to stretch and begins to separate. Now, why does it do that? Well, when you put a supercontinent, we we talked about this earlier, you put a supercontinent like Pangaea on top of the mantle, the mantle beneath that supercontinent is going to get warm. It's going to want, that heat is going to try to escape. And one of the ways that it escapes is it finds zones of weakness. And it turns out that when continents collide, one of the zones of existing weakness may be the very place where the continents collided. So it's not atypical at all for continents to form and then to break up along that same suture line um, where they assembled. There is a, uh, w the fourth of the big five extinctions uh, is during the end of the Triassic. And you can see here, this is a very controversial extinction, by the way. Um, but you can see sort of the diversity here in the Triassic and then we get to the Jurassic, and you see that the diversity, most everything over here is gone. It doesn't make it into the Jurassic. Um, there are a few here, minor clades, minor types of dinosaurs here that were around in the end of the Triassic that then flourish in the Jurassic. So it's a big change in biodiversity between the Triassic and the Jurassic. But this extinction, and there are people who say this shouldn't even be a mass extinction. This should not be classified as a mass extinction because it was too slow. The changes weren't dramatic enough. And so there's big arguments about the about the cause of this end Triassic mass extinction and whether or not it really should be called a mass extinction at all. But anyway, I'm going to go through that. Um, and 
some of the causes that have been proposed for this mass extinction. The first one is sea level change. And it turns out that there was a major regression towards the end of the Jurassic. Remember, uh, regression is a fall of sea level. And then it was followed by a transgression at the beginning of the Jurassic. And it's thought that this, these sea level changes, coupled to the fact that Pangaea was still largely intact, um, may have been the reason for the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. But again, sea level change is relatively gradual, so it doesn't explain why some of those recorded extinctions were so rapid. And I'm going to tell you again that the question of that I showed you on that graph, it looked like, oh yeah, it was for overnight, just like the Permian. Uh, that graph is a little bit tricky um, because the ages, those are all tied to a single age, the end Triassic, but it turns out that those ages aren't very well constrained. There's been a lot of new dating that suggests that this is actually more protracted. The second cause is one that we heard with Siberia, and these are called the camp eruptions. The Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is what the camp is. And this is the it, this is this enormous rifting event. And in fact, it was probably the largest igneous event in Earth history, far bigger than the Siberian traps, um, about 6,000 kilometers in diameter. The Central Mag Atlantic Magmatic Province formed right along the suture of of Gondwana and Laurasia and erupted tremendous volumes of volcanic material, basaltic lavas, and large amounts of gas up into the atmosphere. Here is the extent of the camp. Okay, This is South America, Africa. You see all along the east coast of North America up into up into Eurasia. By contrast, the Siberian traps would have occupied about this much. Uh, would have been about equivalent to about that area right there. So the camp eruptions are far, far bigger than than the Siberian traps. Here are these extinctions. This is the Siberian traps. Um, the, the volume of extinction here. Here's the volume of extinctions at the camp. And then here is the volume of extinctions at the KT boundary. The, this is the end Cretaceous. So these are just showing all those these three extinctions in a row and the intent, relative intensity of those extinctions. And again, this one is shown as a peak. And the question is, uh, at least one of the big questions is now, what is, is that truly a peak? And then this shows the volume of CO2 in the atmosphere during those extinctions. And the key thing here is this large CO2 rise during the camp extinction um, right here. So one of the ideas is that the camp extinction caused a large um, change in climate and that that camp extinction may also um, have resulted in, in these, all the other stuff that we heard with Siberian traps, lots of climate changes, lots of gases up into the atmosphere causing the extinction. Well, there have been people who looked for the other favorite, the asteroid impact, and in order for in order to really hypothesize that, you need evidence for a bolide impact. You need either a crater or you need debris from the crater. Um, and so you look for certain things. So you look for the site of the impact in terms of Cretaceous. The key there at the end Cretaceous extinction was the discovery of this um, iridium anomaly. We'll talk about that. But it's it's uh, an element that's enriched in extraterrestrial objects like asteroids and meteorites, but very, very low abundance in Earth materials. And so at the, in the Cretaceous extinction, right, that end Cretaceous layer, you find this big spike in iridium. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons that people hypothesize that the Cretaceous was caused by an asteroid impact. So you'd like to find that. Um, things like shock quartz, um, stishabite, it's a very high pressure quartz that forms during impact. So again, this is evidence of a body hitting the earth, um, a tsunami also, if it hits the water, which it's most likely to hit, um, it will cause a very large tsunami. Again, evidence for tsunami has been found in the Cretaceous when the bolide hit the Yucatan Peninsula. So you wanna find these pieces of evidence. You, it's okay to say, well, maybe it was an impact, maybe we have no evidence for the impact, 
then it's really hard to argue. So there are candidates for this. Um, and the main contender in terms of a crater location for the cause of this uh, mass extinction is the Manicougan Crater in Quebec in southeastern Canada and is thought to be the largest impact structure known from the Phanerozoic. So it's bigger um, than the Yucatan Peninsula. And if we look at the age of the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, it's about 200 million years, now it's about 201. But the ages for this crater are about 214. Um, and then more recent re research has actually looked, dated the impact melt within the crater also at about 214. This is a little bit early. Um, in fact, about 15 million years early. And if you wanna blame an impact for the extinction, that impact should cause a more or less an instantaneous extinction. It shouldn't. It certainly doesn't take 15 million years for the asteroid to hit the Earth, to eject all that material into the Earth, and to cause the extinction. So it doesn't seem that there really is a good candidate for an asteroid impact um, to cause the end Cretaceous extinction. Um, I mentioned this area, Ghost Ranch, that has a Chin Lee, and I. And I it's kind of a really cool personal tale of dino death, not that I witnessed it, per I'm old, but I didn't actually see this, but I found evidence for it. And we hold our summer field camp out in New Mexico, and one of the sites I, I said was this ghost ranch area. And it contains the Triassic Chinle Formation and also the Jurassic Entrada Sandstone. A, a beautiful area, so this is, the, this is a picture of the field camp. This is called uh, Cerro Paternal. It's a flat top mesa in the Jemez Mountains. These are relatively young volcanic mountains out in New Mexico. Um, and this is this is the area that we map. The Chin Li, this Triassic, these Triassic beds are shown in here and in the valleys, and then they are overlain here by the Entrada sandstone. This is Jurassic in age. So the Entrada ends right about here and then the Chin Li deposits um, rest here. So there is, there, and there is a gap in sedimentation, but this Chin Li deposit is fossil rich. It contains, it's, it contains the petrified forest members, so it contains a lot of fossilized wood. It also contains a tremendous, um, tremendously rich uh, record of things like Coelophysis, um, of some of these, um, uh, other dinosaurs that I mentioned, the early dinosaurs that I mentioned as well. Um, here's Coelophysis, the state dinosaur of New Mexico. If you've ever watched Walking with Dinosaurs, I think the opening scene of Walking with Dinosaurs features Coelophysis showing them hunting in packs. Not clear whether they really hunted in packs. Um, they're relatively small dinosaurs, but um, I wouldn't want to run into one outside my house. And it turns out that most of these Coelophysis fossils are known from Ghost Ranch. It's really rich. If you go out there, and I've been going out there for, I don't know, too many years, but they're still working on this same big block of rock. And they just, they, every time they peel away a thin layer, they find another layer with more and more Coelophysis. So they found a large number of of these coelophysis together and they thought well maybe they they traveled in packs and like I said it's probably not true um, even though shown that way in the opening episode but there's this mass grave of coelophysis and now it's thought to be it was a herd encountering a catastrophic flood um, along a river system the Chin Li formation as I said it's also famous for petrified wood with some interesting finds that have been made in the same layer of this logger stata. Remember that logger stata means rich fossil bed of coelophysis. And the mass grave um, consists of coelophysis and other carnivores, um, and but no herbivores. And that's unusual. Um, it's unusual for so many raptors to conjugate in one spot, especially if they're not pack animals, because generally carnivores you know, there's kind of a hierarchy of carnivores, and and you know, if you if you've ever been to Africa um, on a safari and you've seen a kill, 
what you'll see is that there are the king carnivores, the lions, and those are the ones that eat. And then there's kind of a circle outside of that with jackals and maybe other carnivores. And they all kind of wait their turn to come in. So it's unusual for them all to be together. And so there's an idea that maybe they were trying to escape a forest fire. Well, that's that's a pretty wild hypothesis, right? Although forest fires must have happened um, during the Triassic. So what you need is evidence for a forest fire. And it turns out that because of all this petrified wood, you can find within this layer, um, when you start to look at that petrified wood, you, you find some interesting things. And this is a piece of petrified wood from Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. If you've ever built a fire and watched wood burn, um, you'll know this this kind of characteristic shape of these little blocks. Uh, this is this is burnt wood. It's been tested. It's it's a it's a trias it's evidence for a Triassic forest fire, which seems to fit um, very well with that idea that. Um, at least this is not mass extinction, but this particular extinction that, that is seen in ghost ranches, particular large kill of coelophysis, may have been associated with a forest fire. And this is kind of interesting. When I was digging through, looking for petrified wood one afternoon, waiting for the students, I found a whole log, a whole burnt log. And I, as, I, as I recognized how to find that as I went around the area, I found more and more from exactly that same layer. That was kind of fun. Okay, I'm going to stop there, um, and next time we'll get into the Jurassic, everyone's favorite. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone's staying safe. Um, your first part of the exam is due today. The second part of the second exam is due next week. Make sure you get those in to me um, on time. You have till midnight tonight to get those in, but make sure you get those in on time, and then um, as I get together the final lectures, I'll also work on the third exam. And again, that's all we're going to have. We're going to have those three exams. Um, and it, it should be very easy for you to do well on those. Just give it some, give some good thought to, to those questions um, when you answer them. And I'll see you next time soon.